Hello, it's Scott Medley here. It has been a busy few days and I am wearing the dressing gown of doom, even though it's night time, because we had an incident with the Vega rocket. Now, Vega, if you don't know, is an Italian-made rocket. It has three solid rocket stages and then a fourth liquid fueled stage for orbital insertion. It's about 100 tons overall, able to put about one and a half tons into uh, you know, low Earth orbit. Now, on Monday, while many of us were, of course, glued to our screens watching the slow rendezvous of uh, Crew-1, the Dragon spacecraft, to the space station, the Ariane space also had this launch. And it was launching two very high-profile Earth observation satellites. There was SEOSAT and Tyrannus. Now, SEOSAT is like a Spanish Earth observation, SEO, um, and it's about like 800 kilograms. Then Tyrannus was a French satellite, I think, which uh, was supposed to study uh, atmosphere, like lightning, transient light bursts in the atmosphere. And that was a much smaller satellite. Um, and so those were going to go into a polar orbit. Uh, 600, 700, I can't remember, uh, like sun synch synchronous orbit. Anyway, so this was launched by Ariane Space out of Kourou in South America, that's in French Guiana. The three solid propellant stages went fine, and at uh, eight minutes and three seconds into the flight, the third, the fourth stage, the AVUM stage, kicks in, and the velocity stopped rising as expected. And we could see this thing start to deviate from its expected flight plan in various graphics. The there were propulsion nominal callouts were heard during this uh, while this was firing, but the trajectory was not nominal by any means. So it, it looks like the Avum stage spun out of control, and this is now being blamed on a cabling problem which happened when the stage was being assembled on the ground. So <laughs> they it turns out that the uh, actuators or whatever that control the uh, thrust vectoring on that nozzle, it looks like somebody reversed those. So when it tried to steer in one direction, it was steering in the other direction. And of course, if you've got a system that tries to compensate for turning one way by turning the other way, it's just gonna get into a spin. And it, I believe like closeout photos have already shown that this was uh, the problem. So. That is rather embarrassing, and it's really unfortunate because the Vega had been a very reliable rocket. Had been like had a perfect record up until its first failure, and then it, the first failure it had was due to a, a thermal insulation problem in the front of the bulkhead on the second stage. Again, uh, things looked fine. The second stage started up, and then it failed. They repaired or they, they you know redesigned this, improved the installation, had a perfect launch, and now again they've had a, a failed launch. That's like two failures out of the last three launches. It's really, really unfortunate, but uh, I hope they get that back. This is a Vega rocket, by the way, no relation to Ariane 5, so you know, where James Webb Space Telescope is still safe for now. Elsewhere, since we're talking about failures, or since I'm rambling about failures, we saw the spectacular sparks from the uh, serial number eight Starship prototype. Uh, we saw the overpressure incident, and we finally found out what happened. And as I suspected, the rocket thrust, it was impinging on the pad, and it blew up fragments of material, which entered inside the skirt area, and it sounds like they cut an avionics cable, and that cable meant that the engine wasn't being controlled properly, so it had a rough shutdown. There were propellants still left in the engine, and it continued to burn, and that's how we, we lost the vehicle. So, yeah, you know, the, the pad isn't just concrete. It's actually concrete coated with a material called martite, which is like a, a heat-resistant ceramic-filled epoxy. It's used in flame trenches and uh, by NASA elsewhere, so this is... Total, totally normal. SpaceX has been working with this material for their landing pads for a while. Um, now, some people say maybe we need a flame diverter underneath the launch pad, and that does sound reasonable. But then, on the other hand, the uh, you know, these landings or these stages do have to land on a flat, you know, pad. So, 
they have to be able to handle debris getting blown up inside that uh, inside the skirt area. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to land anywhere. So anyway, yeah, uh, as of right now, it looks like they've replaced the engine on serial number eight. Serial number nine has just rolled out of the high bay, and I'm looking, and, and people have sightings of rings that are for, like, serial number 18 or something ridiculous like that. I mean, they're really building these stages fast now. Okay, final, now, 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 now I can take the dressing gown off. Okay, well, with the dressing gown out of the way, we can talk about other things. Uh, and we're going to start with something uh, that also exploded in space. But this was part of the plan because on Monday night, the US carried out a missile interceptor demonstration. The difference was this time the missile that was uh, intercept or the missile that was doing the interception was launched from a ship rather than from a ground base. So the test was that they launched a test vehicle from Kwajalein Atoll across the Pacific towards continental US. And then, of course, there's a whole satellite network that picks it up. Um, they you know, track it. They figure out its course. They provide a firing solution, which then gets sent to a ship, which launches the missile. Now, the launch, the target vehicle, was a bit of, it was kind of interesting. It was a bit of a Franken rocket. It was like the first stage was a Trident and then there was a couple of small Orion motors on top of it. Those engines are like the ones found in the Pegasus or the Minotaur orbital launch vehicles. So yeah, kind of just thrown together so that they could show uh, something that looked like a ballistic missile. Um, yeah, the code name for this, by the way, was Stellar Lancer, which is... Uh, yeah, sounds like a name of a video game if you ask me. So anyway, yeah, the ship that was doing this was uh, the USS John Finn. It was sitting between Hawaii and California, and it launched an SM-3 uh, Block 2A missile. Now, this SM-3 has had a few different variations over time. You might remember that uh, this type of missile was used back in 2009 to shoot down a satellite as well. Uh, but this is a this is not an ASAT test. So yeah, the whole missile thing is part of a network. They have ground-based systems. We have satellite-based systems. They all work together. Firing solution is sent to the ship, and then the ship launches it, and they successfully hit it. Um, the missile, by the way, the final stage isn't doesn't have a warhead or anything on it. It's just a kinetic kill vehicle which is able to steer on and guide itself onto a very fast moving target assuming it's put into the correct trajectory and so yeah launching a missile from a or shooting down incoming warheads from a ship is a big important step because first of all sure we have the ability in the u.s to launch you know they've demonstrated the ability to launch from california and alaska and that covers some things but you know what that protects the continental US. It doesn't protect things like Hawaii. So sure, you would want to have a ship that was able to do that there. But also, when ballistic missile defenses were being developed, they were originally talking about stationing interceptors in Germany. Uh, and instead, it's decided it's a lot easier politically to just put them on ships and sit them in the ocean or in the sea in international waters where you don't have to sign a whole bunch of treaties and potentially expose friendly governments to the, you know, the, the dilemma of do they accept a missile system or do they um, annoy their potential allies? Um, so yeah, that's that. It worked properly. Again, I'm going to point out this system could in theory also be an anti-satellite system and that's not something you want to say out loud because nobody likes anti-satellite systems. But yeah, the ballistic missile warheads, they actually go to higher altitudes than many satellites. Um, but yeah, the, re the problem with ASATs is that you, sh you hit the satellite and the debris remains in orbit. In this test, the warhead is, is suborbital and so is the interceptor. It's very, it's possible that small fragments get accelerated onto proper orbital trajectories, but almost everything is going to fall back to Earth. Finally, the big, big news, of course, was Crew-1 launching to the space station, the first operational mission of Crew Dragon, which has been certified for human space flight by NASA. And of course, that means that not just NASA can fly on it, but many other people can fly on it if you've got the money. Uh, yeah. This is also the first time in history where we've had four people flying on a rocket 
uh, which doesn't have a capsule with wings, right? Because the space shuttle, though the last mission of the space shuttle actually only carried four people, but it had wings. So I guess this is some sort of, you know, cool thing. If you think about the last time a space capsule launched from the USA was the 1970s. It was for the Apollo Soyuz test project. And that was a very, very different era. So yeah, obviously the launch went off. This audio, by the way, the ground audio in the NASA stream was marvelous. They set up microphones that you were really able to hear the rocket, you know, breathing almost, right? This, as it was loaded up with cryogenic propellants, you could hear stuff hissing and moving around. And the launch, the, the, the audio in that was great. And I really hope they make this available because commentators were of course talking all over it. And sure, you know, commentators were great, they were doing their job, but they were covering the sound that I really wanted to hear. I wanted to have, I just want to have like a giant sound system playing this sound to me because I am, I like rockets. Like, I, I, I don't know what else to say. So yeah, they had a fairly long rendezvous with uh, the ISS and you know, we were able to watch this slowly over time. I actually got a video um, of the spacecraft, you know, from the ground, I could see the ISS and the Dragon 2 just probably about seven and a half kilometers apart. It was right around the time when they were performing the final burn to bring them up to the waypoint zero. And I did release like a very quick video to explain how the proximity operations would work on the space station. It was very short, I because I had a, I have a very big video on proximity operations that I'm trying to figure out, but uh, but then I realized that I just didn't have the time to do that properly. Uh, yeah, in addition to the four astronauts, of course, we had uh, the foundling, better known as Baby Yoda. <laughs> And and so yeah, I'm wondering uh, how how that's going. Are, are they all going to have like watch parties for the Mandalorian? Uh, it it is. I'm sure they're all pretty much fans. So yeah, that's that's great. Now we have seven people on the space station. Uh, we've had like a peak of six people living on the space station for extended periods in the past. There have been times where there have been more people on the station, but they've all been on short missions, spending like a week or two on the station. Either they were on a shuttle crew or they were like a changeover crew. Uh, there was a time when they had nine people that were all launched on Soyuz. But now this is seven people doing you know, space station operations. And this is great because if you think about it, when you're running the space station, you have all these maintenance tasks and they have to be done. So that cuts into the amount of science time that is available. But now you've got more people, that extra person that gets added they could do 100% science and you would still get the same amount of maintenance done. So that's that's great. Uh, um, we're going to have CRS-21 launching to the station um, at the start of November, uh, sorry, December. And that is going to dock around on the top on the PMA-3. Uh, it, can't, it won't dock to the front node because, well, Crew Dragon's there right now. But it docks on the top because it needs to, the, tr the stuff in the trunk and the arm needs to be able to get in there to grab stuff out. Um, also, a lot going on in terms of uh, in the Russian segment. They, today they were performing a spacewalk. Uh, Sergey and Sergey, yeah, <laughs> before <laughs> before Crew Dragon got there today, uh, you know, a couple of days ago, 66% of the people in space were named Sergey, right? <laughs> How about that? Uh, yeah, Sergey and Sergey were basically doing a spacewalk. The first spacewalk out of the Poisk module, which has always been there uh, available as an airlock, but they've done all their spacewalks out of uh, Piers. The reason is they're finally getting rid of the Piers module, which has been their primary airlock, because they need to make that node available, that docking port, so they can dock in the new Nauka module, which is a science module that uh, was built... 20 years ago as a backup for uh, Zvezda and now it's actually getting a uh, it's been refurbished it's been tested it's been broken it's been fixed it's been delayed but it's it's launching next year and the space station is going to get a lot bigger but first of all they have to get rid of the old Pierce module and yeah it'll be a shame to see it go but yeah space station getting bigger and all that so yeah that's my 
bit. I, I'm really hoping to get back to regular service, but things are very, very busy right now. Um, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs> <laughs>